Let's commence our course on mastering FECO emulsification. Uh, if you look through the program book, you would find several courses on complex situations in uh, cataract surgery, complications, uh, complicated cataracts. But I think 95% of the time, 95% of us keep doing regular FECO emulsification. And I've been doing FECO emulsification like most of the others in this audience and this panel for about two decades. And I, the way I do my routine FECO emulsification in 1997 to what I'm doing today is completely different. And the results are different, the expectations are different. Essentially, this course is about, uh, uh, this course is essentially about uh, these routine cases, how to master each and every step. We are not going to be talking about compli complications or complexities. I have requested all my co-instructors to stick to eight take-home points in the eight minutes that's allotted to them. Hopefully, we'll have some time for discussion also at the end of each presentation. And uh, to uh, get the ball rolling is uh, Modern Biometric Concepts by Dr. Partha Bishwas. So thank you very much for including me in this course. And uh, it gave me an opportunity to look into the literature and find more about biometry but what is very important, again, just to remember, the basics of biometry is really important. And we have to determine the intraocular lens power. The two variables that we have with us is the diaptric power of the cornea and the measurement of the AL, the axial length of the eye. Now, the keratometry readings can definitely be measured by all these ways, the manual, the auto -K, the pentacam, and the obscan. And the axial length has, the, has been uh, the contact method and the non-contact method of the ultrasound. The immersion is definitely superior. But point number two and where we come is the optical biometry. The optical biometry has actually revolutionized a lot of the biometric issues that we had in the past. And it is based on the laser inferometry or the partial coherence inferometry. And there are some very important facts to this. The ultrasound and the optical biometry are nearly never the same. The optical AXL is always longer than the ultrasound. The endpoint of the optical measurement is on the RPE and the Brooks membrane. And that is the reason why it is different of a value than the ultrasound biometry and the end point of the ultrasound biometry is on the vitreous and the optic nerve head. So what does that mean? That means that the IL diopter that is calculated of the optical biometry is always less than the ultrasound biometry, 0.4 to 0.6 approximately. And this has to be compensated by a specified A constant factor, which you can see there on one of the IOL uh, packages. So the manufacturer, the manufacturer actually specifies the optical biometry as well as the ultrasound biometry A constant. So what is the advantage of the optical biometry? Well, it is reasonably fast and it is quite user friendly and your biometrist does not need much time to get into it. Non-contact method is a big, big importance and therefore you're not touching and no question of uh, infection getting across. So giving, uh, uh, it gives us a refractive length and an anatomical axial length, which is a very true value. It is very precise and the operator independence is achieved. A very high ametropic patient with the aid of proper fixation is an advantage. And of course, measuring the fovea in cases of posterior staphyloma or coloboma or silicon-filled eyes is again an advantage. And all the results are uh, observed at one go. However, there are certain problem areas and it does not work in media opacities like the central corneal scar or dense PPC, does not work in vitreous hemorrhage or it is difficult in pediatric or mentally challenged patients and patients with poor fixation. And of course, a minimum amount of pupillary dilatation is required. 
Of course, and the cost factor is also important. It is a little higher than the uh, ultrasound biometry. The recent studies tell us that it is repeatable and reproducible, and the final IOL power calculated, uh, the, the sign it is... So the recent studies, what do they tell us? The final power calculated is uh, the PCI and the ultrasound immersion method showed a significant statistical difference, but of less clinical importance. And there were other studies that were carried on. So the fact comes, we all own, or we have all owned uh, ultrasound biometry. Should we replace it by an optical biometry? Well, if, it is, if you've been doing it with the immersion, and the optical, so if there is a corneal, central corneal scar, the nuclear sclerosis and dense PPC immersion will still work very well. Pseudophakia is variable. Silicon-filled eyes, difficult with the immersion. Vitreous hemorrhage, yes. And posterior staphyloma, coloboma, definitely the optical biometry scores over. The formulae, the old or the new biometry formulae has always been a dilemma and it plays a very important role. Therefore, selection of the proper formula is very important. We've been used to the regression formula, the first and the second generation formula, and based on the mathematical analysis of a large sample of post-operative data, it still fairly wo works quite well between 22.5 millimeters of axial length to 25.0 millimeters. And a correction factor can be added for the longer eyes that is greater than 25 or less than 22.5. And this is for the compensation. Most commonly used is the SRK2. The third generation formulas are, of course, include the two important, the surgeon factor as well as the AC depth. Hoffer Q for short eyes is recommended, Holiday 1 for long eyes, and SRKT for very long eyes. The fourth generation formulae are the latest and most modified, and the Holiday 2 has come in, the Higgis formula has come in, and uh, with these, but still, where can we go wrong? So, the mechanical error is important. If the calibration is not done regularly or a faulty transducer is there, that is a problem. Human error or the K-linked syndrome, as we can call, or the A-linked syndrome. So what is this K-linked syndrome? That is the keratometry-linked syndrome. The calibration defects might be there. Patient posture has to, be, has to be laid importance to. Positioning defects are important. And uh, if we come, and irregular Myers, if you have irregular Myers here, then that is also a problem. High astigmatism is, again, a problem area. A-linked syndrome, calibration again, quality of the amplitude of the spike, fixation of the patient, misalignment of the probes. And these, uh, the inappropriate formula being used and the standard deviation to be taken, these are as aspects for the axial length calculation and has to be taken into account. Now, you've calculated everything well and you had a PCR and the IOL has to be placed in the sulcus. So what does it do? What does it mean? So to change the diaptric power of the IOL, if the capsular bag does not allow the placement of the bag, there's a thumb rule, and if you have a 28.5 and greater, then decrease it by 1.5. 17 to 28, decrease by 1. If it is 9 to 17, decrease by 0.5. And if it is less than 9, then let it remain the same. Post-refractive surgery, again, a very important aspect. And the central cornea is flattened in a refractive surgery. The axial end remains the same. And therefore, there are hyperopic surprises which come in, and these have to be taken into account. And this is, and it, is, it might be difficult to retrieve the pre-op data. So what to do? So the Pentacam gives you a fairly accurate measurement of the post-corneal post, uh, the post, the post surface, which can be used, and the flattest K has to be taken into account. The RGP contact lens method also gives a good way, the Higgis formula, 
on-table retinoscopy. This is another aspect which, if your senior most optometrist can give a good retinoscopy value, it works well. And uh, I've been using this as my last method to a certain, and we have not had refractive sur uh, surprises as of now. So nothing, again, is foolproof. So one should stick to uh, which is most consistent in one's place, and uh, that is what is best. And in these post-refractive eyes, uh, residual myopia is always better to be aimed than a full emetropia. And proper counseling of the patient is very important so that IOL explant or re-implant or a piggyback is taken into account. And number eight, my take-home message is... Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Partha, for that uh, comprehensive presentation. For me, there are a couple of take-home messages from his presentation. Number one is completely give up contact A-scan. I'm sure most of you have already done that. But I, uh, as far as we are concerned in our institution, we do both immersion A-scan as well as laser interference biometry. And as far as immersion A scan is done by a qualified technician who is com completely comfortable with the instruments he is handling, we find the results match up, line up quite well with uh, laser interference biometry, except in those extreme cases like a posterior staphyloma, post refractive surgery, etc. But most common cases, these two work very well. So if you can't afford a laser interference biometry, doing a good quality immersion A scan will also help you very well. Then shift over the later generation formula. The more number of variables a formula takes into consideration, the more accurate are the results that you get. That's why the holiday two, with uh, which Partha alluded to, which takes into consideration seven different variables is more accurate. Now uh, the formulas like the Graham Barrett formula, the Hill formula, etc., becoming available. And these are all accessible on the website. It's, now, it's a free download, and if you use these formula, your results definitely tighten up. Uh, with these few words, now I request uh, Dr. Jeevan Titial to uh, talk to us about incisions. Thank you, Dama, uh, Dr. Ramamurthy, and uh, good morning to all of you. We all agree that uh, good IOL power calculation would be desirable in all cases. But to begin with the surgery, incision is the one which gives you access to doing a good surgery. No financial disclosure. Look into the components of cataract surgery and its incision. You look into four aspects. One is the location of incision, which will make a difference. The size, shape, and its architecture. Because all four things are very, very important. And you all know the ideal incision should be such which doesn't induce astigmatism, so that you don't change your refractive outcomes in your patients, gives access to your surgical steps, and also gives access to the implantation IO which you have desired. And should be self-sealing without causing a leakage uh, during surgery or a post-op period, rapid healing, and give a predictability in your uh, this thing. Let me take you to the location of incision. Where should we place them? The two ways. One is the position of uh, limbus, where you're going to place near the limbus, anterior or posterior, or clock R-wise. So looking into a position incision, you have three options. One is a clear corneal incision, which is right up to the clear part of the cornea, you can see here. Second would be a position which is near clear corneal, I think which is the most preferred incision now for a, a incision which are less than 2.2. Or you can have a scleroconeal tunnel, which is desirable in some situations where you have a weak uh, limbus or a surrounding cornea in those cases. But looking into incision as per the placement, clock R wise, you can place superiorly, temporarily, which is the two standard ways to do it. But always look for a corneal topography of your patient before examination. You just see here the cornea is against the rule here. The appropriate the incision should be temporal in that case so that the steeper axis gets flattened and you have a lesser astigmatism in your patient. So indirectly saying this will control your astigmatism. See this topography, it is uh, with the rule astigmatism, vertically steep. Therefore, you're going to place incision which is vertically placed. Therefore, you have to shift your incision if you're looking for a, a normal phacomystification, conventional ones, we are not planning toric, the incision can be excess phaco in those cases. But if you have this type of topography, uh, depending on how much cylinder you have, let's presume this is one eye which has less than one diopter cylinder at uh, against the rule axis. So I'll do a near clear corneal or clear corneal incision which will take care of a little bit of a steepness which is there in these cases. 
But if you have slightly 1 or 1.5 diopters, then the option is to place a clear corneal, opposite clear corneal incision, which will also target to reduce this steeper axis and have a, a, a flattening of this axis and getting your astigmatism decreased to a reasonable outcome your patients without thinking of toric implantation. Opposite clear corneal incision is a good concept uh, in FACO surgeries to decrease a cylinder in a post-op period, which is around 1.5 or less. Then size of incision should have a proper matching of instrumentations. So if you are looking for 2.2 incision, then your all accessories of FACO should be 2.2. That means your needle, your sleeve has to be desirable, otherwise you're going to have problems. So if you have a too short tunnel, you have a leaky wound, you have a difficult surgery. If you have too long a tunnel, again it's a difficult surgery. So sizing or tunnel should be also nicely made. Apart from that, the architectural incision can be uniplanar, biplanar, triplanar. As you see in this small video of mine, the little fast, you can see here, this is a uniplanar incision near clear corneal, right up to the limbus. Just go there, go straight up to the mark, which is around 2 millimeter inside and 1.5 millimeter uh, in, a, in a original width. If you see this IOCT picture of same incision, you can see a clear uniplanar incision in this patient, which you see here. So this is what it looks like to begin with the surgery. So this is uniplanar incision, most often quite correct for 2.2 to 2 millimeter incision in your patients. This is a poster picture after surgery, very nicely formed. You can do a biplanar incision also with keratome. Keratome should be uh, not used before. It should be a new one so that you can place in a manner which gives a biplanar incision. First you go deeper, then, uh, then flatter, then deep into the antechamber. It gives a typical biplanar incision as you see in IOCT here. So this is what uh, also in a little slow motion here. You can first is engage, go deeper, go parallel with the iris uh, corneal plane, dip it down, then enter. So it gives a very nice biplanar incision like this. You can see this picture here. This is the initial dip, then going straight, gives you through the cornea and then goes down. And this biplanar incision will remain uh, uh, quite intact. And this is a, one of the safest incision possible in near cl clear corneal incisions, which also uh, can be achieved with femtosecond laser also, which gives you a very nice uh, planned, customized biplanar or triplanar incisions, which is uh, uh, retained till the end of surgery and post-op results are quite significantly better. But if you have a biplanar incision, always the ceiling will be much better than a uniplanar incision in your cases. So sometimes you can have a leaky wound to begin with, your incision was quite correct, but towards the end of surgery you have this type of uh, hydration which is not achieving the opposition of inner flap with the outer flap. So once you have this, never play with too much of hydration. More hydration, more damage to the posterior lip. It's better to put one suture and make a compromise situation to be safer for your patients. Similarly, sometimes you can have wound side detachments which is quite common uh, in these cases. You can see a small detachment uh, being there in the post-op period also. This is seen almost in a 40 to 60 percent of your cases, but it normally doesn't make a huge difference. But if you have a large decimal detachment, then on table you should be doing uh, measurements to decrease this detachment. As I said, there are very few indications where you may have to do a posterior clear corneal or scleral tunnel. One of them is a radial keratotomy patient because incisions are right up to the limbus and there are chances it may open up. Or there are situations where you have weak corneal like a keratoconus, tagia, or post keratoplasty patients, you may have to do a little posterior clear corneal incisions. In all those situations, you might, must put a suture so that you have a safeguard of your cases. This is one of examples of a poorly made incision. You can see it's a very tight incision here, and everything is tight. The needle is one side. This side is going to have a wound burn in this patient. This is one of my fellow left-handed surgeons having a difficulty in doing, you know, Smaller incision, not suitable uh, instrumentation. The sleeve is very tight for this patient, and the needle is not straight. You can see, once it goes this side, the entire needle this side, there's no fluid, and this side, the heat transmission will be towards the wound area. Always play it in the middle of the wound so that your needle remains straight, and the fluid core is there throughout your needle, 360 degrees. See what happens through the end of surgery, that uh, surgery could be finished. The entire incision remains hydrated, distorted, and this is going to cause a lot of problems. That is what you have to make sure that proper instrumentation should be matching your incision. See this incision again done by one of my fellow, a very long uh, tunnel being made. You can see this is a desirable site, but it has gone right up to the almost 
3 millimeter into the cornea. Once you have a longer incisions, this is normally seen with the, you know, either a blunt instrumentation or you're not really uh, happy with the, the target pressure. So sometimes too much a high pressure or too much a low pressure can give you a, a very undesirable incision. See how much of the haze there and entire surgery can be difficult in those cases. Astigmatism can be managed by various aspects of incision apart from the main incision which I talked about. You can combine this with the clear corneal opposite incision. You can combine with the arcuate, limbal relaxed incision to decrease the incisions. And surgically induced astigmatism is consideration. It is directly correlated to the size, shape of incision and placement clock or wise. Nowadays you have access of various image guided systems which can give you a typical orientation of incisions. Suppose you want a 0, 180 degree, it can be done. You want any axis, the incision can be nicely moderated as per the image guided system. This is very, very useful for uh, toric implantations and you know, for multifocal implantations and so on. And also very important for uh, calculating your surgically induced astigmatism also. Intraposity sometimes gives you a very good uh, image imagination, which you had earlier could be seen directly in the microscope and you can prevent uh, having uh, problems during uh, your uh, desperate detachment getting larger. This is one uh, study we uh, presented last year. We had a typical t pattern of incision here. You can see here, this is the initial uh, incision making and you can very clean, sharp, uh, uh, proximal wound. Once you have this type of wound uh, in the proximal area, chances of desperate detachment is very, very less. But if you have a ragged incision like this, the chances of desperate detachment wound site is very, very high. Almost 100% of cases will have a desperate detachment. In a difficult cases, it can extend to a large uh, uh, desperate detachment also. And uh, wound site desperate detachment can have problems like after a few months, you can have a retraction of wound. This retraction will cause change in the astigmatism, which is after one or two, uh, three months. But if you have clear wound, the chances of wound retraction is very less and induced astigmatism also goes down. To summarize, incision is one of the most important aspects of surgery. Gives you a good access. Look for a pre-existing astigmatism. Plan your incision accordingly. The IUL is a major factor for a size of incision. If you have a good foldable lens, the size goes down. You have to use a rigid lens, the size increases. And today, I think the incision is governed by the IUL size and its incision techniques. Thank you for your kind listening, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Titial. The recent concepts are coming up, both from Graham Barrett as well as uh, Doc Cock, that uh, especially a 2.2 millimeter incision, because the uh, induced astigmatism has a more direction as well as magnitude, is just about 0.1 diopters. And effectively, the Barrett calculator does not uh, take into consideration any surgically induced astigmatism. They also say that the on-axis placement of incision is not important, especially if your incision is less than 2.4 millimeters. We did not cover that. So these are, of course, recent concepts that are just emerging in the last two years. <coughs> Would you like to comment upon that? Yeah, you're right. If your incision less than 2.4, then uh, maybe the induced astigmatism may not be huge in those cases. But I still consider if you're putting a, you know, a, a toric or a multifocal lenses, where you have to calculate uh, beforehand. Barrett may not consider, but if you go for online calculator like Al Alcon or other calculator, they do have a surgically in induced astigmatism of yours to be put in there. And if it is less than 2.2, normally I put 0.25 as a my you know, SIA uh, of calculations. But if I do a routine surgery, it may not be a significant point because there the consideration is not decreasing the, the astigmatism to the zero level. I think that is uh, quite all right, but if you incision 2.8 or bigger, it, is, it has an impact. Would you like to comment on that, Dr. Hamdai? I think uh, uh, you're right, actually. Uh, uh, Warren Hill was with us last year, and he said this has very little relevance. But I just want to stress a very important thing I learned, uh, it took years for me, is to pay attention at the end of the surgery incision, as Professor Titial said, look at it. Whether uh, it is 1.8, 2, 2.2, 2.5, it's, it's not important. In your hand, with your technique and instrumentation, please pay attention to the distortion of the incision as it showed so beautifully at the very end. That's what you're living in the eye with that. So pay attention to that. How you fashion, what was the size you initiated is important, but more important is this. So thank you. I think I just want to add one point, didn't highlight that. Whatever we have seen, a little bit of wound side detachment, which is very common in the phaco surgery, but we have realized this can be increased during the hydration phase or the last phase of surgery. And your wound hydration should be carefully done so that you don't enlarge the, you know, desperate detachment, if you have a little bit of desperate detachment. So you have to be a little careful not to engage 
or in, in too much of hydration in those, your cases. Maybe one small suture will handle those cases. Uh, I heard Osher, uh, I think two, two years back, what he does is he takes a 2 mm incision and the inner lip he slightly uh, increases to 2.4. So it is like a funnel. The outer part is 2.2 and the inner part is 2.4. It gives more maneuverability in the NTHM. Okay. I think you. that's an Thank excellent you. tip. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Dr. Chitra talking to us about capsular excess. A very good morning to one and all of you. Thanks to Dr. Ramurthy for including me in this uh, course. I would try to keep it as uh, <clears throat> basic as what this course has been uh, defined to be more practical and uh, uh, right for each of us. So I'll start with my first pearl, the art of performing rexes. It is critical that we understand that this is the very first step if uh, the second step of the surgery and it has to be optimally designed not just to make the phaco surgery effective safe but it's also important to realize that getting the right size rexes as i'm showing here a marker is being used we need to understand that the cornea has a magnification effect so the mark if it is a five millimeter mark it's 14 uh, uh, it, it gets magnified and it would be a little more about 5.25 or 5.3 you could actually stain the capsule and it's best to approach through the side port so that you do not distort the main port because the AC shallowing could cause the rexis to extend. Try to keep grasping and re-grasping in your initial days or even later on and try not to create a large flap so that bang on, if you're conscious, every single case of yours is like this, then you would have really re achieved, uh, hope to achieve a target emetropia in most of your patients. The next very important pearl is centration or overlap of rexis. What I mean by this is that it is important that your rexis overlaps at least 0.5 millimeter around the circumference of the optic. And this is so critical because this ensures that the lens is in a shrink wrap effect pressed against the posterior capsule, does not allow posterior uh, cell, uh, I mean the lenticle uh, cell proliferation or a posterior opacification to occur to a large extent with these better quality uh, lenses which you have. But more importantly, keeping this exact shrink wrap effect ensures that the IOL is centered, uh, there is no decentration which is possible, there could be no asymmetric contra coverage of the, any part of it which could cause a contracture of the capsule bag, it would prevent a tilt it would ensure the effective lens positioning of your lens in each and every case. And that is so important, in, which is incorporated in our IUL formulas. And we go in for the best of the formulas and we do not consider this exact overlap of the rexus over the optic of the IUL. Then we are compromising on achieving a target emetropia. And this gets even more exaggerated in extremes of axial length in a, in a high myope and a high pro. Even in toric IULs, you would find the rotation of the lens is, I mean, is more likely, the IUL stability is compromised if you do not get this kind of a centration and an ideal wrap around. Now, this is a case a patient would have been very optimally promised. And uh, if you see in the other figure, it's a centered. Those rings are right centered because there is an ideal uh, capsule wrap over the optic. Whereas here, because it is extended beyond the optic, so there is this uh, epithelial cell proliferation, PCO contracture, and you end up with this kind of a situation. And you're stuck with this patient, and you could never justify the harm which you have done to him. Today, we have the very latest uh, Varion imaging device, which not necessary we need to have it, but it definitely makes things a lot easier. And it is a virtual marker here. So it takes away the corneal magnification effect when you have these manual devices placed on the cornea. And so the exact measurement here, it's 5.8 rexes is the measure you would get it, with the more capsular rexus overlay coming in, you would manage to get this kind of precision, a constancy in your rexus, which is promised on a femto cataract platform. Even if you do not have that exotic a machine, having a digital imaging device definitely ensures a greater safety because this is something so critical in getting your best outcomes in phaco emulsification. Pearl three, the challenge comes when you're dealing with a intimus and cataract, all of us know that definitely 
gets our heart in our mouth because we're never too sure about our constancy in these kind of cases. But what is most important, what is because these, the lens matter is swollen, there's a water cleft here, and intraluminal pressure is high, something all of us know. So the sensible thing is to go in, create a side port, go in through the side port, ensure that you have the capsule dye has been used. Start with a, just a small lick. Actually, this is an older video where the nick is larger. Make a small lick and go back and decompress the contents of the bag. Use a syringe and try to make as much of a removal of this milky fluid as much as you can to the extent that you see that the capsule, anterior capsule, actually becomes concave from the convex configuration. The convex configuration would cause it to rip right to the periphery and you geopoindize the whole case. You're never too sure with the dynamics of the phaco emulsification, what all could occur, the PC could rupture, give way, anything would happen. It's not that, that once you decompress is enough at every point of time, probably this could be the slowest step in our phaco emulsification, but we need to keep going back and decompressing, removing as much of the milky fluid, keep injecting viscoelastic, try your best to go through the side port, but at times the capsulorexis forceps comes off head because it gets you to grip closer to the, uh, where the capsulorexis is attached to the margin of the capsule. Try to grasp, try to re-grasp, make it small moves, the rexis here is large, so I'm going to land in trouble, mind you. But if you keep to a smaller rexis, you could even enlarge the rexis before you start your fake emulsification or at the end of the case. I should have decompressed here, but see what happens. Because I have been a little careless, there's a rip, and all my initial efforts have gone to waste because I was in a bit of a hurry and did not keep decompressing the bag. Having said that, there could be a situation when you've just made one nick and then there is this bidirectional extension as you see and there's something all of us have seen in our cases so we need to be just complacent yes there is a compromise you do not have your capsule wrap but probably because there's an extension this, this tear could go right up to the equator and the posterior capsule so if the softer cataract we could go ahead and bring it to the supra capsule of uh, space and do a phaco emulsification place your lens and after you have placed your lens make a small nick and try to create a semblance of rexis to what extent you can rather than leaving it like that so that there is some clearing in that area and you do not end up with a phimosis. Although this is a compromise, but this is the best which you could do in a bad situation. The next area of challenge is an elastic capsule in a pediatric cataract. And I'm sure if I, you have a pediatric of the, uh, 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 ophthalmologist here, he would tell you he could go on hours about how critical this step is. We need to understand this is an elastic capsule. So it could ha it has that elastic recoil and you make an incision, it could just shear and rip to the periphery if you're not very cautious. You need to stain. If you could use a high-end viscoelastic, it's even better. Make a very small nick and keep going back and try to grasp the capsule and pull it centripetally or 180 degrees away. Use the capsule or excess forceps, but ensure that you do not press on the posterior lip so that the visco does not digress and the AC doesn't shallow. And you need to be very meticulous as to how you're going about it because I believe more than the adult, the young child needs to have a premium surgery at every point of time. Try not to make the flap too large. That's something very, very important. Keep going back and filling and refilling with viscoelastic if you feel the AC is shallowing. And see, and see the way we are pulling it. Pull it at 180 degrees towards the center of the eye. If you notice that the flap has already got larger here, which is not what you should do, you should try to keep the flap as small as possible to ensure that you get this kind of a circumferential wrap. There's another way of dealing with these pediatric cataract. One is to make incision diametrically opposite, and this is called the push-pull technique. You are push, uh, pushing it, and then you're pulling it down, and this seems to work very well if you have got used to doing it, and if you bring it down to the center, these two uh, uh, flaps would meet, and you end up getting the right round rexis which you want, which is one way of dealing with these elastic capsules. Going on, uh, just a word about doing a posterior capsule or rexis. Now, Essentially, when you're doing a pediatric cataract, after you have placed a lens, you could go in and make a small nick in the posterior capsule. It is less elastic, though thinner than the anterior capsule, but you follow all the dictums of how you would uh, go about doing your rexis. You could normally, in a PCC, you should have three to four millimeter, but in a pediatric capsule, it could be a, even a smaller rexis, but it's mandatory that you follow it up with a good anterior vitrectomy so that your anterior hyaloid phase does not opacify. 
going on to another trick which you need to know is how you would enlarge the rexis. So if you have created a small rexis and you have a hard cat, right, go tangentially with your scissors, capsule rexis, and just make a small, create a small flap as you have seen. Of course, a, a dye is needed, viscoelastic should be there, but you need to go into the main port, so don't press on the posterior lip. Ensure that you carry this small flap circumferentially around, be slow, keep going, grasping and re-grasping, which is something you need to keep remembering constantly as you go along, and then you complete the rexis. And sometimes it would happen that you've done your phaco emulsification in a soft cataract. After placing the IOL2, do not hesitate to make this tangential nick and make a complete, a little larger rexis because a smaller rexis would definitely compromise with phimosis and its own challenges. Uh, a brief word about a capsular uh, nick, like if you have a blunt diamond knife and there's so much of pooling of fluid, you might have created a nick here. You do not start off with your uh, uh, continuing your excess from the discontinuity which you have created, but you start it at a different point as you have seen here and carry it exactly round and circumferentially and maybe in the end you might have to join that primary nick, but you end up with a nice round rexis as has been shown. A small pupil again needs a word of mention. Sometimes you need to use the pupillary margin here in these cases if it helps you as a marker and to create your incision. But this was a fairly soft cataract. You could do away with this kind of a pupil diameter. But if the pupil is smaller, any point of time, do not hesitate to make those four side incision. Use your iris hooks unfailingly, although there's a little delay in your surgery, the surgery quality of the surgery or the safety of the surgery is never compromised. And again, if you have ended up with a small rexis after placement of the IOL, do not hesitate to enlarge it so that it optimally hugs your uh, IOL optic. A word about a fi fibrotic capsule, like what we need to understand that areas where the fibrosis is not dense, it's just a child's play. But when there is this kind of a fibrotic band, you would try, but when you realize that you're just stretching the capsule or excess, which could actually end up with a dialysis of the bag, so you, know, you need to understand, see, I'm trying to push and pull and traumatize it more. You could, it could actually rip for all you know. At that point of time, do not hesitate. Use your scissors, make a small nick, and then you are able to continue circumferentially using uh, and end up with a fairly good rexis uh, in this particular situation. However, if you have a femto cataract platform, it makes it even more good because you are able to plan your rexis, customize it so that it comes to extend beyond the area of fibrosis. And if you see in this first case, what is you're fairly sure that you have a sort of uh, escaped it. But normally in a femto cataract, all you have to do is just bunch up the rexis, which is free floating in all cases. But here what happens is in the area of fibrosis, you're not sure whether the femto laser has perforated those areas of fibrosis. So you may have to go about it to ensure that you, it's cut all around. In this, kind, in this particular situation, it was even more difficult as you could see that it, uh, sorry, I don't know whether I'm running out of time. Yeah. Oh, okay, going on to the, no, sorry, I'm very sorry. I'll show you my just last case, which just gives you an idea about the challenges. This is a case of subluxation, and you know it's not just the pseudo-elasticity, but the absence of zonules, so there is no tangential uh, grip of the anterior capsule. So sometimes it's the ingenuity to hold the capsule and ensure that there is a tangential force which is being created, and then continue to do your capsulorexis. So this is just one other way of handling it. I'm not showing these videos because I'm sure you would be hearing about it. Just a word about the inferior posterior capsule of pacification. In those high myopes wherein you cannot go ahead and do a YAG capsulotomy, what you could do is, you might find it that the, if the rim is so closely attached to the IOL margin, so you might have to make, maybe even make a nick or manage to somehow insinuate your instrument behind it and do a complete posterior capsular polishing, but you would be able to get it all done in most of these cases. So it's endless how much you can talk, and I've already shown that I could continuously talk, but what we need to take home is a good capsular excess is essential and integral in getting an optimal and safe phaco emulsification. Thank you. Thank you. As you've all seen, there's only so much control you, are, you can exercise over your wife. <laughs> uh, 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 Anyway, it was an excellent presentation giving a broad overview, but if there's a single tip that I want you to carry home, don't go ahead and buy a femtosecond uh, laser, but buy that 5 millimeter round ring. And if you place it uh, centered onto the visual axis, if you place it on the cornea, no need to stain it. Because of the 14% enlargement that you get, you get a, a circle corresponding to 5.5 millimeters, 
and within the 30 to 45 seconds that you need, your cornea has to be dry when you place it on the cornea. You just keep the confines of rexis, preferably through the side port within this uh, ring, and you will find that invariably you get a fairly decent centered rexis. Please try it. You, I, I do it every time. Over to you, Dr. Bai. Thank you. I do receive research grant support from Alcon Laboratories, but has no relevance in this presentation on uh, how we manage the nucleus. Uh, whatever the strategy you, uh, is appealing to you, uh, make sure it is safe to the eye, is very effective, and is very predictable that every case after case, in that particular category of cataract soft, medium, dense, it works predictably and is reproducible. So I think that's very important. And other concept uh, which I took years to understand is that Remember, there are different phases of lens removal, clear or cataract. And each phase has a distinct objective, uh, light sculpting as a different objective, and chopping and the removal of fragments and so on. Uh, and also, therefore, each phase will require different parameters. And what are these parameters? Not only the aspiration parameters or energy parameters, but also the input to the eye, the bottle height, if you have that machine, so keep changing the input and output at different phases because then and then you will achieve that objective very effectively, predictably every time. We understand the problems with nucleus division if it is a, a kind of a choppable cataract. And there are two basic options, the direct chop or a horizontal chop, which is the most efficient chop. But you need to understand that you need to learn the art of putting it behind the pupil, under the axis, and close your eyes and imagine that this is what is happening. But it is so effective that you can really save your time and make sure that it really works very well. So that's a great technique, and I do it many, many times. But the safer, and particularly when uh, one is mastering this, is the idea of a space which uh, the uh, uh, Paul Koch introduced sculpting and notice the objective here is not to occlude the tip go slow with the third position when you forward retract second position make sure the vacuum is only little because you don't want a vacuum you want energy more and the bottle height has to be just enough in this case the bottle height is about 50 centimeter and so so having a space is very good idea and depending upon the density you will like to create the space deeper in a denser cataract and the place when you want to begin your first division. So make sure you create a space in that area. We describe a technique in a paper called Stop, Chop, Chop and Stuff uh, at that time where we describe a chop technique called, we call it Chop in situ, which later on next year was labeled as a vertical chop. Whatever that chop is, if you combine in a particularly denser cataract and go in a step-by-step -step manner, you will reduce the bag distortion and the zonular stress to the bag. And this animation will illustrate uh, what I mean. Uh, do not aim a straight cut when you begin in a hard cut like a karate. Aim a partial crack so that you reduce your force of division, whatever that action is, horizontal or vertical. And then produce that extension of the initial crack to the depth from periphery to the center in a step-by-step -step manner. This uh, video illustrates and highlights that principles that you occlude it going in the third position, retract and your paddle go in the second position and initiate a crack and then extend that crack by repositioning the chopper into the depth and bring it to the periphery to the center. But in some cataracts, which are leathery and the brunous and the black, and all are, we all are blessed with those here, uh, we need to have all the tricks. And one of the tricks we found very useful, and many are, are already doing it, is what we describe as a multi-level chop technique. You produce a crack at one level, and then again repeat that procedure at a different depth or at a different uh, level from uh, periphery to center in a horizontal situation so that you just do not have to have an excessive force of division uh, which is both a chop action and a lateral separation combination. 
So reapply your vacuum seal nearer to the fibers you want to, you want to divide. And this is one example where uh, to highlight what I mean is that having created a space, you produce a division by applying the vacuum seal at one level and then with a very gentle, this is a pseudo exfoliation eye, a gentle pressure, initiate the crack, take it out and reapply, re, rebury that, impale it again at the deeper level and then, then do that so that the back distortion is, is minimal. Do not have too much of an excessive force. And the same multi-level chop can be produced in a direct or a horizontal chop, first by placing that chopper to the periphery, as, as peripheral as you are comfortable with, bring that crack up to the occluded tip, and then uh, reapply, re-impale toward the center, toward the incision, and extend that crack more uh, across the hard cataract. So this concept of multi-level uh, will allow you to produce chop in these difficult, bulky cataracts where the bag is already overstretched with loss of elasticity and sometimes zonules. And at the end point, aim multiple small fragments, particularly in a denser fragments. And in management of soft nucleus, there are many, many tricks. Everything works. But what matters is, is it going to be reproducible? Can you predict that this soft cataract or a jelly cataract is going to be removed today in the posterior plane or anterior plane, will it subluxate? So I find that good old four cordon technique, which some of us learned, there are not many left now uh, who, who started with this, uh, is it a good idea still, except that now you reduce the aspiration flow rate, reduce the vacuum and the bottle height to make it safe so that you can go right up to the periphery. You don't need to do that, but you can, or as deep as you can, and then divide it uh, like that. So soft cataracts or four cordon technique is still important. Remember, total amount of energy is very important, but that's not the only thing. The time you take to deliver like a 100% burst versus 50% or 30% three bus is, is more safer. And the plane at which you deliver is very important. And that, that's where some technology like OZIL or a, or a transverse uh, the, uh, energy movement helps you to keep this fragment getting repositioned at the tip at the same time. And this is uh, my colleague, Dr. Sambre Shivasa, who who published this in article and showed it in high-speed photography, how these newer technology allow us to keep the fragment at the tip, and, and we, we, we called it carousoling, but whatever it is, uh, use this technology if you have it, uh, and, and also monitor, and, and Dr. Tityal uh, showed this technology in incision, and you can do this uh, to make sure that the fragment is away from it and not like here, where the fragment actually comes in very vicinity. Therefore, uh, have a technique of low, slow motion or low parameter where you can house it and also protect the endothelium uh, with the appropriate viscoelastic. And although I'm an alcohol consultant, uh, visco is something I would recommend in, in eyes where the endothelium is not good or if your technique is such that your fragments come closer to it. So to, to simplify, keep iris as a mark, and avoid this kind of situation. You may be quicker. You may take four minutes, but you don't want that. You may have a less uh, CDE or EPT, but do not do this. But how this fragment away from it takes slower time, lower time, and you do that. And what we call a step-down technique, instead of, uh, uh, as, as the more and more posterior capsule get exposed, do not lift the phaco probe away from the posterior capsule, which is, uh, you know, you're intimidated. Instead, keep the same plane, but reduce the parameters. So that step down on the parameters as more and more posterior capsule get exposed during the fragment removal is something will ensure a posterior plane and, and uh, would uh, make a clear cornea. Very finally, high parameters is an appeal because it's very fast, but remember, we found in our own hand high versus low parameters, where in high we took us less clock time, less fluid and less energy, the corneas were thicker, less clear compared to the lower parameters where uh, we took more fluid, more energy and more time. So you balance in your hand and also it has a tremendous effect on IOP, higher parameters with higher bottle will give you a higher 
uh, IOP in the eye and higher fluctuation. And this, this video, which won an award uh, four years ago, and once again, Dr. Sumrish produced that, even in an intact posture capsule and an intact antivitus phase, a high bottle height and high parameters can produce a leaky barrier. And uh, he showed it so cleverly, uh, you injecting triamcinolone in anterior chamber and with raising the bottle height and flow rate uh, different levels. And he found that triamcinolone penetrated into the vitreous cavity in spite of the anterior capsule, a posterior capsule intact and intact antivitus phase. So finally, I want to remind you that we have a September 2nd, 3rd colloquium 2017 when Graham Barrett is going to be our main chief guest. So thank you for patient hearing uh, and thank you, sir. Thank you, Avai. As usual, a clutch of beautiful videos. But I do feel there's still quite a few in the audience uh, who are quite happy with their four quadrant technique or a stop and chop. They're getting excellent results. Their patients are happy. First day post operative, the cornea is clear. Do you think it's really mandatory for them to switch over to uh, direct chop? Or if so, what are the kind of cases? How do they do the transition? Now, I think. Uh all chops are very good, direct or stop and chop. I think everything has uh, a good strength. The strength of the direct chop is that it's very effective. So uh, with the same degree of uh, vacuum, for example, 600 direct chop can go through more effectively than 600 in a vertical chop or other things. But having said that, you need to tighten the safety. And safety is an issue at times with direct chop or horizontal chop because you have to place a chopper in a very critical space behind the iris under the capsule. So if you, if you keep doing it, it's a very good technique. It's, it's, it's your trainer, whoever has trained you and what you've done. It, both are very good. I, I don't have a particular preference. I use direct chop in a very leathery black cataract, always direct or a little space. Uh, when I said direct, I, it may not have to be really uh, truly direct. It can be, but a small space is okay. But horizontal uh, Nagahara chop is more effective uh, with the safety issues, as we all know. But do you think these things are possible only with the high-end machines no, 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 or even with the mid-level machines no, I, possible? I think uh, the techno, obviously, higher the, uh, the control will be better in a higher machine. But uh, the real thing is, you know, skill. This is more of a technique with technology assists, but the skill doesn't assist technology. The technology assists the skill. So if you understand the clarity of mind, what you're doing, you can do wonders. You, I'm sure you guys sitting here will do with any machine. You, give on, you will do exactly the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Dr. Mahipal talking to us about IOL implantation techniques. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramamurthy, for having me in the course. Well, when you are doing a cataract surgery, uh, no cataract surgery today is complete without achieving the ultimate goal of the surgery, and that is visual restoration with least dependence on glasses. So the final step that you have after doing the phaco emulsification cortical cleanup is to implant diligently and successfully an intraocular lens. And ever since the first intraocular lens was implanted on 8 February 1950 by Sir Harold Ridley, uh, there have been several evolutions in how the lenses are placed and today foldable lenses are almost married to a phaco emulsification procedure because you have reduced the incision and you wish to push the lens through the smallest possible incision. When we started foldable lenses, the material that was used was silicon and then acrylic came on and what we used to use was a holder folder which nowadays nobody is using and we could have the lenses jumping away and slipping away. But nowadays you have what is known as the injector systems. The injector systems allow you to minimize the incision size and to cause least disturbance onto the incision. And there are varieties of injectors that are available for folding in the lens and releasing it gently so that when it opens, it opens without a jerk. Now this is a typical injector that you have which is uh, used with the uh, Technus 1. So it is easy to load. This is a bevel tip. Uh, there is a reduced angle which is designed for the micro implantation. So this is just to show you the cartridge uh, that will be used. Uh, then it is an ergonomic design and then you have the lens which needs to go here. Uh, and it needs to be always used with a viscoelastic. So that is what needs to be done. The 
cartridge is fitted on to an injector system and the injector system could be a disposable injector system or it could be a metallic or a titanium uh, injector system. Now what is important is that what pushes the lens in needs to be rounded and what why that is important is that it needs to fit in exactly at the junction so that it does not cause trauma on to the intraocular <laughs> lens and after the lens has been released it needs to be friendly to the capsule also so that is what is important that you have it is preferable to have a different color uh, in the disposable injector systems this uh, uh, is covered by a silicon or a plastic so that you are not causing uh, 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 an injury onto the intraocular lens and I personally prefer an injector system which has a screw system so what it does is that it never comes out with a jerk but when you have one which just pushes it you can have one hand kind of free but here you will have to use both the hands so it is entirely up to you what you want my personal preference is to do with a screw now when you have the lens that needs to be put this is what very important the lens needs to make what is known as an inverted S position. That means that if you have a lens which is showing you an S, that means the lens is upside down. So what is important is that when you are fitting in the lens, you need it to have an inverted S position and you want the haptic of the lens to go onto the, hap onto the optic and that is very important. Now let's just see the uh, presentation. Platinum 1 series cartridge. First remove the cartridge from the inner tray and fill with Helon viscoelastic. Next, grasp the lens with your forceps by the optic edge only and hold the cartridge with the IOL diagram facing up. Engage the lead haptic with the canopy and sweep the lead haptic over the optic body in one motion, leaving half the optic inside the cartridge. Ensure that the lead haptic is fully tucked over the optic body. Grasp the trailing haptic and tuck it over the optic body. Advance the lens past the line marked on the cartridge. Ensure that the lens and haptics remain folded in place after removing your forceps. Next, insert the cartridge bevel tip so that it slides into the handpiece cartridge slots. Push down firmly on the back end of the cartridge to securely snap into the handpiece. If the rod tip makes contact with the cartridge, the cartridge has not been inserted correctly. Retract the rod and ensure that the cartridge is fully snapped into the handpiece before moving forward. Okay, so uh, though this is a film uh, by Abbott, I, w I don't uh, usually use Helon as it's recommended, but I use methyl cellulose, what is there. Now when, our, when you are doing it, the precautions before injecting the eye is that you first need to check the alignment of the plunger with the optic. And what needs to be seen is that the plunger does not move over the optic but is actually pushing it. So that is very important. And first always check whether it is by the uh, screw system or otherwise that the IUL movement is free and it is not stuck. Because if you are putting too much of force, that is what can cause you problems and can cause the uh, issue of posterior capsular rent. Now what is important is that though there are some people who recommend putting an IUL with an AC maintainer, I normally always use viscoelastic and this is here where the capsule needs to be well inflated, the capsular bag and you need to place the loaded IUL with the bevel down. So if you are pushing with bevel up into the incision, that is when you can cause desmets detachment and you gently push the plunger noting that the IUL is opening in the interior chamber. Uh, you need to direct the leading haptic. So when you are pushing in case of an IUL, you need to make it push towards the optic nerve. So you need to go in and that is what is important and you dial the trailing haptic into the bag and then you dial it anti-clockwise. In case you are looking at a toric IOL, the marking has to be done either manually or as you can see with this bubble marker or if you have a Varion system or a Callisto system, then it can be markerless. And the loading of both the toric and the multifocal IOL is similar to a single piece lens which is there. Now, let us just see that, uh, uh, let us just see uh, the three piece IOL, the right way and the wrong way. So you can see this is an overlay. 
just watch this when the haptic is opening into the capsular bag and just see the movement that is there so the lens has been the hand has been moved so that the lens has opened into the capsular bag and then you need to push in the and there you can see that you are there the haptic goes into the capsular bag so this is very very important and then you can see now let's look at the insertion which has been done in this particular case just watch here this is the lens which is a it seems to be having a slight override now you see at the haptic that is coming out and at this particular moment you the movement of the hand is not there and you can see that the lens instead of opening right is opening downwards and the person has taken out the hand so therefore the lens gets stuck the haptic gets stuck and it is kind of rolling back and that is the problem that you have so the mind you the lens needs to go in and you need to have the movement of the hand so that when it is opening it is opening like a cauliflower or it's opening into the eye and you need to do that now you have also preloaded iol injector systems uh, which you can see are actually no touch so you don't have to pick up the lens and put it so these are preloaded systems with lot of companies have come in where the viscoelastic is is put into the uh, injector system you just remove the cartridge and put in the lens bring it to the position and then you can put it into the eye uh, very safely and gently so what is important in preloaded is that it goes through smaller incisions as also what is important is that you do not touch the iol in these particular cases now let's just tell you one or two important things and that is the twist over or the upturn of the lens and then if this happens then you have to flip it over with two dialers but you need to have a good viscoelastic preferably something which has chondroitin sulfate or sodium hyaluronide now look at this particular case where the uh, where the doctor is doing putting in the lens and just see that the movements are tentative there is a mismatch between the size of the incision he is trying to push it making the incision as part the tunnel as part of the of the cartridge and just see this so there is a tentative movement it's not going in and the surgeon just withdraws the hand okay and can you see that that's the lens that's getting stuck on to the wound so what is very important is don't come to this level if you feel that the incision there is a mismatch in the injector system please withdraw it at that particular time there is no harm in enlarging the incision it is better to enlarge the incision rather than rip it apart so that is what is very important and don't end up in a situation here where you are just struggling and the lens is stuck in the incision so you will have to go back again and do that so other commonly encountered problems are that the hydrophobic uh, hydrophobic materials offer are tachic that means that they keep attached on to the lens the optic keeps the haptic keeps attached on to the optic so what you need to do is gently tap on to the haptics or inject viscoelastic and separate the two with dialers or even when you are doing ie at that time they tend to open sometimes the temperature has a problem so if they are like in the uh, lens with the bosch and lom it really if you are working in cold conditions they doesn't really tend to open and finally you have the uh, newer advances wherein they have tried to actually do what is called as an auto cert wherein you are uh, putting the intrepid the auto cert iol injector is a new infinity vision system innovation yep. Well, so you can see this this is the lens which comes here using and, the infinity and foot switch and it is the foot switch that helps that loading the iol into the cartridge is similar to existing twist or syringe type injection only now with auto cert the software will automatically advance the iol to the ready to implant position the iol insertion is completed under surgeon foot switch control which can be customized to surgeon preferences for iol material and incision size with auto cert the surgeon innovative surgeon selected pause feature helping reduce stress on the iol yeah so this is the auto cert injector system so friends all that i will wish to say is that whenever you have a lens please study the injector system and work accordingly and the minor movements that you wish to that you should have 
will help you do a flawless uh, introduction of the intraocular lens and that is the end of the surgery that one wants to get a good result. Thank you very much Dr. Ramamurthy for that. I just wish to invite you for the IIRS annual conference on 23rd and 24th of September in Delhi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maipal, for that uh, very practical tips that you have offered. I think to me the most important tip is that if you feel resistance while introducing the intraocular lens, something is wrong. It just should slip in smoothly. If the plunger is overriding the optics, that's when you uh, have uh, feel resistance and if you push it through, this is an explosive uh, introduction of the intraocular lens. And uh, secondly, that's when the damage to the optic haptic junction, etc., occurs. And if in case there is resistance, don't uh, hesitate to withdraw, make sure that it's loaded properly, then introduce it. And uh, another aspect is you want smaller and smaller incision. There's this concept of wound assisted implantation. Since you covered incisions, Dr. Uh, uh, Titial, would you like to say something about it? I think uh, Dr. Mahipal nicely covered the entire range of uh, techniques of IOL insertion. As you rightly said, uh, if you don't want to disturb your incision, then wound-assisted uh, insertion IOL is one of the best way to maintain the, you know, the incision you have made it. So there are certain precautions required for a wound-assisted insertion is your cartilage should be well engaged into the external lip of the wound before you start injecting your IOL. And make sure there's a little space between IOL and the tip of a cartridge. If IOL is right up to the tip of the cartridge, then difficult to insert the lens through the wound-assisted area. And you require a globe eye to be fixated because you require a secondary force from other side to support this injection because your one hand is not free. If you're using what Dr. Mahipal said, you're using a screw technique, then both hands are engaged. In those cases, sometimes wound-assisted is difficult. In those situations, it's better to be inside the cornea, inside the wound area. But wound assisted is always better because it doesn't enlarge the incisions and make sure your other hand supports the globe and it goes very nicely a controlled way. So I normally prefer wound assisted and especially the auto set where your both hands are free. I think that's the best way to insert IOLs. Thank you. Uh, now we come to my uh, presentation. Can you put the time back? I'm starting my presentation only now. <laughs> okay, it's measuring and optimizing outcomes. And uh, basically, you have heard all that you have been doing all along, but maybe this is something you do not do routinely. And why is this important? Because we are able to improve our quality only when we measure them. And it has been repeatedly shown that prospective monitoring of outcomes was associated with an improvement in outcomes in studies. And self-evaluation leads to self-improvement. Basically, what I have seen is, whether it's watching my own videos or watching, looking at my own results, is really a very educative exercise, and that's what uh, helps me to improve as to what I'm doing. Why do we normally don't do this? Because we are busy clinicians, we have more interest in the practical aspects of what we are doing. We are, there's a lack of awareness about existing free options. There's several softwares, etc., that's available, and also the uh, tedious process of loading in data, analyzing it, unless you are in the habit of doing it, seems to put some uh, practical surgeons off. And also there is the uh, challenge of having a follow-up of these patients. What exactly do you monitor? What exactly do you measure? Basically the psychological. We all heard about 6 by 6, 20 by 20. But what's most important is 20 by happy. So irrespective of what you do, what you, the kind of vision that you achieve, whether your patients are happy with the kind of outcome that you're offering to them, and then the functional, that is whether they are able to carry on. There's a quality of life questionnaire that we administer covering about 14 different aspects as to whether the normal activities like driving, sewing, knitting, working in the kitchen, reading newspapers, etc., they are able to do comfortably. Then, of course, the physiological testing of the vision on the refractive lanes. What exactly are the standards that you try to uh, reach out to? These are what is recommended by the WHO. Uh, or obviously, these are not the standards that are applicable to a high-end surgeon who is doing premium intraocular lens. So as far as the standards that are concerned, that is something that you need to decide on yourself. You are not competing with the surgeon next door or the surgeon in the next city, but you are competing with yourself. 
what you have to do is to what are the results that I got this year? Is it possible to improve upon it in the subsequent year? Is that what you are looking for? The questionnaire that you need to uh, use need not be too extensive. Don't collect excessive data because that will put you off. Basically, what we normally collect is visual acuity, pre- and post-operative, intra- and post-operative quality complications. And then one in five patients is administered a quality of life questionnaire. Basically, we get a data analyzed for every 100 odd patients and then have a good, a good look at it. It's better to collect data from a large number of patients or a, almost you are all your patients rather than collect too much data from a small limited numbers. Then finally you have this uh, manual tally sheets in case you are not doing large numbers, less than 300 cases per year. You need not you go on to computerized programs. It's possible to enter into this. All this available on the net. And this is an excellent system that's available, monitoring cataract surgery outcomes. This was basically published in the year 2010 by the International Center for Eye Health, by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I know that this is not a very practical topic. It's not uh, uh, too interesting to many of you. But once you get into this and you start analyzing your outcomes, you'd find that there is a definite improvement in what you're doing. This is what my outcomes have been studied in one month, in the uh, month of October uh, of 2017, the different types of lenses that were implanted, the techniques that were used, and what exactly was the uh, visual outcomes at the end of six weeks. And this is the quality of question, uh, vision, uh, quality of life questionnaire that's administered, not to every patient, but one in five patients. There's different, these are 14 different activities that the patients routinely perform, the ease with which they perform, and then finally there's a result that's uh, given as to what exactly is your score. Look at this. This is what my score is out of 14 patients who are analyzed out of 70 odd. Nine of them are 100 out of 100, but some of them 100 percentage. Mind you, some of these questions may not be applicable to some people. If it's an 80 year old lady who is asked how comfortably you drive, obviously she's going to say, I'm not going to drive. So these are essentially percentage scores. And what you find here is that it's not just the operative procedure, but even preoperative selection is important. This is the kind of questionnaire that we administer to all of our postgraduates who are essentially training on the SICS. And at the end of the month, we uh, share it with them as to how exactly they are performing and how they can improve upon it. So what is the things that we analyze? We look at selection of patients, the criteria for surgery, the surgical procedure, what is the spectacle correction that's given, and finally the sequel of the surgery, whether it's a... Uh, whether the patient has cystoid macular edema, a thinned uh, retina, or some corneal problems because of which the visual outcome is not so good. So the implementation of this is quite possible. Once your entire team understands that it's extremely important to uh, look at the scores, and once the habit comes in, it's almost something like people are waiting to look at them. It's like cricket scores where they want to see at the end of the month or end of six weeks as to what exactly they're achieving, and is it better than what they were doing the previous month. This is not something to compare with individual surgeons. That will set a very bad precedent, but that's something, information that's shared only with the individual surgeon. If necessary, the head of the cataract unit talks to them so as to improve upon their outcomes if certain points have to be uh, specifically attended to. Good outcomes of cataract surgery is what leads to high volumes, sustainable ICAS services, and in this way, I think measuring and optimizing outcomes is extremely important. Thank you so much for your attention. And now we have Dr. George Baiko talking to us about. Uh, I think you finish off. You have been waiting. Talking to us about uh, uh, the extended uh, depth of vision lenses. He is a very prolific surgeon from Canada, often seen in Indian scenario, a very dear friend of most of us, and a wonderful speaker and a wonderful surgeon. Dr. Baiko. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the different extended range of vision IOLs, how they work and what the outcomes are. Um, I have a number of financial disclosures that are relevant to this. So why do we need extended range of vision um, IOLs? The problem is that 
traditional multifocal eye walls, although they provide excellent functional distance and near vision, are associated with a decrease in contrast and increased risk of glare and halo over monofocal eye walls. And that's a problem that we continually face with using these eye walls. So what strategies have been used recently to try and overcome this? Well, we can modify the spherical aberration, we can use the pinhole effect, or we can use diffractive optics. And I'd like to quickly uh, explain how all these strategies work. So you're used to seeing spherical aberration correction and you're used to using it in order to obtain the best possible vision for patients. We know that if we target zero spherical aberration that we get fairly good outcomes for them. And we know that the, this is data from uh, our own studies looking at the cornea and we know that if you match the spherical aberration of the cornea with the IOLs that are available to us using negative spherical IOLs that we can improve the contrast sensitivity and the level of vision for the patients. But what you probably don't know or you probably haven't thought about is how these lenses are designed. If you look at a zero spherical aberration lens such as the BNL series, the power across the lens is the same um, in the profile. If you look at a positive spherical aberration lens, the central portion is decreased in power and if you look at a negative spherical aberration lens, the central portion is increased. So if we look at a 19.5 diopter lens, the central portion of a positive spherical aberration lens is about 18.75 diopters, while that of a negative spherical aberration lens is about 20. So you get an advantage of about a diopter with a smaller pupil, a three millimeter pupil, which is what your patient will be using for looking at near things. And that's why when we first got these lenses and we started using them, you saw reports of people having better depth of focus or better near vision with aspheric IOL. So that's inherent to them. What you didn't know is that you can increase the depth of field or depth of focus with these lenses by modifying spherical aberration. And this um, study was originally done by Caroline Roca and Ron Kruger. And you see if you have positive spherical aberration or negative spherical aberration, um, you can increase the depth of focus by about two diopters. We know that age-related cataracts uh, help our patients by doing that because elderly patients not only have nuclear sclerosis with a lot of positive spherical aberration, they have small pupils, and they're able to see both distance and near, and so it's a natural adaptation that's occurred. Well, can we use that to our advantage? And the answer is yes. So if we leave some positive spherical aberration in the system when we do our cataract surgery, we can increase depth of focus. And this is a comparison in which you look at patients and you try and obtain zero spherical aberration. And what you find is that the distance vision will decrease if you use myopia of minus one and will decrease even more if you use a myopia of minus two. However, if you leave some positive spherical aberration in the system, 0.2, di 0.2 microns, you can see that you can maintain the distance vision and the near vision. So you lose a little bit of quality of vision, but you gain a depth of focus. So you can use this to your advantage. Um, there was a lens that was designed by Graham Barrett to take advantage of this. And essentially, by using this positive spherical collaboration, you can see how you have a decrease in the contrast to a small degree, but you have an extended range of seeing. It was a lens that was produced by Hoya, and the defocus curve for the lens showed you that you had a greater um, a defocus curve or greater amount. And if you introduce a little bit of um, myopia on one eye, you could actually get a curve that's very similar to a multifocal eye well. And in a small series of patients that he presented, 42 patients, 59 eyes, he was able to show that using this monovision approach with this extended depth of focus lens that he could achieve 20-30 vision at distance and near and intermediate vision. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened to the lens because I haven't seen any further reports on this lens, but certainly that is something that has been attempted. We could also do the same thing with the Calhoun lens. As you know, you can change not only the um, refractive, so the sphere and the cylinder in the lens, you can also change the spherical aberration and in a small group of patients in which they did that, they were able to show, and I'll just quickly go through this because we're running out of time, but essentially they were able to show that by leaving spherical aberration in the system, you were able to improve vision for patients. So we can actually use spherical aberration to our advantage in order to increase the, the range of vision. 
one lens that tries to do this is uh, the Minival, which is uh, made by Sci-Fi Medic in Italy. It has a uh, central positive spherical aberration and a peripheral negative spherical aberration. So when you're looking at distance, the negative spherical aberration comes into play and gives you clear distance vision. When you look close up, the pupil gets smaller and you're using the central portion. And this is what the lens looks like. And they were able to show in a small group of patients that they were able to achieve good distance um, and near vision, binocular vision with this lens. If you look at the defocus curve, there's two diopters with a mean visual acuity of 2040, better through two diopters than that lens, sorry. And if you look at reading vision, and we know it's important to maintain at least 80 words per minute, this lens is able to achieve 80 words per minute in 90% in of the patients at 0.5 log rad print. So certainly something that's worth considering. So spherical aberration can be used. We can also use the pinhole effect. Um, as you know, as you get a smaller aperture, you get an extended depth of field. And for 1.5 diopters for a 3 millimeter pupil and 2 diopters for a less than 2 millimeter pupil. So the people who make the camera uh, inlay, AccuFocus also make a lens that's very similar in design to the camera inlay. Um, and this lens has been implanted in a number of uh, patients showing that it has an increased depth of focus. And if you target a little bit of monovision in the second eye, you can increase this even further. And studies have shown that it's been fairly effective. Small groups of patients, 16 patients, 16 eyes, showing that they maintain fairly good vision. Um, the other advantage of this lens, as we were talking about yesterday, is that it can be used in post RKIs because you're using that central portion. And this has been something that people have used in South America and in Europe, and I think also um, Morshore has designed a similar lens for that. So the third strategy is technus, and I'll spend a few minutes trying to explain how this lens works, as I'm sure we're all very curious. But it uses three uh, optical strategies. The first is spherical aberration control, so it corrects that 0.27 um, microns of spherical aberration, so it has that central add because greater power from a negative spherical aberration lens that we talked about before. It also has chromatic aberration control and this modified diffractive, which I would try to explain to you. So how does chromatic aberration help us? Well, we know that in the phacic eye, when the light goes through the lens, it's spread into its components, um, in, in blue light being focused close, closer, red light being focused further apart, and it's a difference of about one and a quarter diopters. So if we use IOLs, we get something similar to that, um, and it all depends on the refractive index of the IOLs. The higher the refractive index, the more dispersion, and the higher the refractive index, the lower the Abbey number. So if you look at this data, and if you look at uh, the AMO acrylic material, which has a, a lower refractive index than the Alcon material, you can see that there's a difference of almost a diopter in this, in this chromatic dispersion. So having this material certainly makes it, the, the vision much finer for the patients, and this is just an illustration of what that would look like uh, by comparison. There's also another advantage of chromatic aberration that comes from the AMO design. Uh, a typical lens will result in the blue light being focused closer, but if you put the diffractive optics on the back of the lens, it actually flips it around. So the red light is diffracted closer, and the combination results in less diffraction. So chromatic aberration makes the image sharper, and this diffractive component makes it better. So what is it about the, uh, the symphony that makes it in extended range? Well, it has to do with actually the optics and the diffractive optics. Uh, we know that as um, light goes through uh, a lens or any material, it actually uh, is slowed down or it's changed in speed. And this is called the phase shift. Now, if you introduce a prism and light goes through this prism, it actually is bent. So not only do you get a change in the, in the phase, but you also get a change in direction. So these steps that you have on the back of the lens, the diffractive steps, will change the direction and also the speed at which the light goes. And you can modify these, the name for that step in the diffractive optics. And every diffractive optics that we've had, the companies have had a 
proprietary uh, means of making that either a three ad or a two and a half ad or changing the focus. And all AMO has done is sort of extended that focus by using a different proprietary set of steps and allows it to have this extended range of vision. And if you look at the water bath, and I'm sure you've seen these, you can see that the water bath actually shows this uh, quite effectively. We know that this uh, lens is also independent of pupils, the MTF, and you've seen this data before showing that in the original New Zealand study, um, you had a sustained mean visual acuity of 20-20 or better through 1.5 diopters of defocus, and an increase of about one diopter in the range of vision and if you go to 2040, you can get two and a half diopters of defocus. Um, if you combine it with a little bit of um, model vision, so um, if you uh, decrease it by uh, 0.75 diopters or, or myopia 0.75 diopters, it decreases the log mark by 0.12 in the distance vision, but increases by 0.12 in the near vision. So in the large study that was done in Europe, a multi-center study showed that if you didn't do the monovision, you got good results. But if you did a little bit of monovision, micro-monovision, you got improved results, especially in the intermediate and near. And uh, a lot of these patients were free of spectacles, so it certainly does work. There is still a problem of a bit of glare with Symphony, and the, and the glare that the patients report is this uh, sort of spider web glare it's in a small percentage of patients, much smaller than uh, we have with multifocals, and it seems to diminish over time. And it's not something that most patients, it's something patients are aware of, but it's not something that they uh, ask to have their uh, lens removed. And it's now available in a torque form. So there are three strategies that are available. They all involve using a bit of mini monovision in order to get the depth of focus, but they certainly accomplish uh, what we're hoping with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George. Would, do you, in your practice, uh, do a monovision for them, or you tend to, uh, as regards the near vision? No, I tend to do a bit of mini monovision because you I do? think that, yeah. yeah. And uh, it all depends. I mean, the first eye I try and target for emetropia, and depending on what I get, then the second eye I will either compensate and get a little bit of, of um, monovision in there, minus three quarters of a diopter. Okay, uh, because uh, what uh, Rondio recommends is to actually do uh, overcorrection by 0.5 in both the eyes. And uh, you could have both eyes together like a 6666 6, 6, 6 partial for distance, and near would be N6, N8. Uh, and because the depth of focus is large even for distance as also for near, so a 0.5 does not militate against a patient doing well both for distance and near. But I, I think it's also important to look at pupils because I, I yes. you know, I measure those pre-op in all patients. I measure them under protopic and mesopic conditions, and I will actually change what I do. If people have smaller pupils, I'll go for emetropia. Okay. If they have larger pupils, then I'll do the monovision more often. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Beko. And uh, uh, we go on to all of us need to be hydrated now prior to lunch, <laughs> and so does the, uh, the lens in the eye. So the last topic, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Gaurav was uh, busy elsewhere, so he'll be talking about the hydro procedures. Uh, uh, Dr. Gaurav, as you all know, is involved uh, as member of the scientific committee just now, and he runs a very successful practice in Dehradun. Dr. Gaurav. Thanks, uh, Dr. Maikpal, for the kind introduction, and thanks, Dr. Ramamurthy, for inviting me to be on this course. I took the liberty of adding hydro maneuvers because uh, uh, that would uh, help me show one or two other uh, aspects as well. So uh, I think uh, we are all pretty good at now uh, managing our hydro procedures, and it's still very important because it's critical to the success of your surgery and the safe uh, success of your surgery to get that right. So for those of uh, you who are still young and uh, starting out your careers, maybe uh, it may be a good idea to understand the hydro procedures. Now, once you have your excess right, uh, you can go for a hydro dissection. Now, typically, I don't do hydro delineation anymore. When we started our careers and when we were doing ECCE and SICS, we were taught to vigorously do hydro delineation because that would make the size of the nucleus much smaller. But today, I don't think we need to do hydro delineation at all, uh, except in a few cases. And hydro dissection, where you create a cortical cleaving uh, dissection between the capsular bag and the cortex is what works best for 
proper rotation as well as uh, easy uh, removal of the cortex at the end of surgery. So I use this flattened uh, hydrodissection cannula as do many of us, but it could be any kind of cannula, but this is like, uh, let me just take you beyond and show you. This is just flattened over here. So typically how I do it and after trying the various ways of doing that, what I've understood is that if you use this bevel up cannula and just go under the edge of the rexis and lift up uh, the edge of the rexis say about 0.1 mm. You should not try to inject just in a blind plane which is under the uh, capsule. I try to tent it up a little bit, just lift it up a little bit. Uh, not so much that you might break the rexis, but if you just tent it up a little bit, your fluid wave will go so much more easily and in a more controlled way and you'll get a very good uh, dissection, uh, a fluid wave just like that and it goes across and then I use this hydrodissection cannula itself to just rotate the nucleus. I don't go to a, a chopper as uh, I used to do long many years back. In fact, this is one old video which I pulled out where I was using a chopper. So it just shows you I'll avoid the rexes because that's been covered. But let me bring you to the point where uh, we do this uh, hydrodissection and then the nucleus rotation. So those who would like to do it in the classical way as has been taught, they would probably want to use the chopper once the hydrodissection is complete to check for the nucleus rotation. It's good to check for nucleus rotation, but see again, I'm doing the same thing as I did uh, uh, in the previous video, doing that hydrodissection with the fluid wave which goes through and then use a chopper or a dialer to just check that the nucleus rotates. If it doesn't, you can probably try to rotate in the opposite direction or maybe even try to get another fluid wave. Now, coming to hydrodelineation, so there are some instances where hydrodelineation will still be required. Now, this is a posterior polar cataract where uh, I can suspect that there may be uh, strong adhesions between the posterior polar cataract and the posterior capsule and getting a cortical cleaving hydrodissection may be dangerous in these cases because you may end up uh, uh, rupturing the posterior capsule. So here it's a good idea to create a hydrodelineation and create an endonucleus as I call it. So you dissect out an endonucleus which you will remove first and then you can remove the rest of the epinuclear shell which has been dissected and left out. That brings a lot of safety and uh, just see that when I put this, you have to embed into the nucleus. Usually if it's soft, it is easier to do, but you can see that you, have, you might have to go into two or three different planes and then get that fluid wave right. So here we are trying to create that golden ring uh, which comes with hydrodelineation and just see that I went into a different area because it wasn't happening and now I've managed to dissect the endonucleus out and create a good hydrodelineation. In fact, you can actually check to rotate whether, whether this endonucleus rotates or not. And then you can proceed with the surgery very safely, leaving behind that epinuclear shell. So you can probably see in this video as well that it's a softish cataract, but I'll probably use uh, this uh, uh, as a FACO aspiration to remove this uh, nucleus, uh, the endonucleus itself, leaving behind that nice shell which is protecting your posterior capsule and even if there is a pre-existing uh, posterior capsular break you will still have a nice cushion to work on which you can remove at the end of surgery very safely. So uh, I am not uh, going to leave, I am not going to touch the posterior polar area first but you can see it's tending to come. It's not a great thing to happen because sometimes this will just pull off the posterior capsule and then I can just Got get the cortex later. Going on, you know, you can actually f see the end of this video where we managed to remove that endonucleus. Going on, uh, there was a posterior polar cataract which had this pre-existing rent. Now, this is a situation where you have to be very, very careful and gentle with your hydro maneuvers. And uh, here you can just see that we managed to do a hydro delineation itself. Just see, uh, similar to what we did in the previous case. And here, rotation should not be done at all because otherwise it will just, so just disengage it. Now these, uh, so much for the hydro maneuvers, uh, hydro procedures and uh, let me take you to one trick, a nice trick which is uh, also a hydro maneuver as I said. Now when you start surgery, you create the side ports and typically inject viscoelastic to the, through the side port and then make your main incision. I do it a little differently and after making the side ports, I uh, just go and use BSS on a 2 ml syringe with a hydro dissection cannula itself and I just form the chamber like you would do at the end of surgery when you're sealing your wounds and just see how it helps. Can you see? So this is only one advantage. If you have a lot of sinecae, so let me take you back and show you how easily these uh, sinecae were broken, but it has other advantages as well. So when you distend the chamber with BSS, usually with viscoelastic, you will not get a proper distension and you know, you'll probably have the viscoelastic escaping out and it will not retain. So you will not get a tight eye to make your main incision, but if you use BSS, it almost seals the wound. 
and then you can go and make your main incision in a more effective and much more predictable way. So I like to do it like this and of course from the side port it's also more difficult to inject viscoelastic so I don't use viscoelastic at all till I've made the main incision. Coming to another small nice hydro maneuver, uh, here we have this pediatric cataract where you know we finish the surgery, put in the lens, I'm using this infusion handpiece in my left hand, this is the same infusion which is from your bimanual IA. And using this to keep the eyeball tight, I'm making a small supra-incisional tunnel. So off late, uh, any child which is over 5 or 6 years, I first use this to seal the wound. If it doesn't seal, only then I suture them. Now just watch that I've gone just over the main incision and created a small pocket. So it's just half a millimeter ahead of the main incision and it's only a pocket. It's not a full incision and I'm hydrating only that pocket. So uh, this is a supra-incisional pocket and once you hydrate this, your wound is going to be... 100% sealed, it will not leak and to check whether it leaks or not, I think I showed this video elsewhere in the morning so some of you may have already seen it but I feel very strongly for this so I'm showing it again in a different uh, cause. Varuk. So I'm, this is the last video in 5 more yeah, seconds. I have no problem, the Alcon feels very strongly that you're going into their lunch symposium. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'll be over in 5 seconds now. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. So Tripan Blue, you can inject on the ports, 3 ports and if the fluid is uh, flowing as you can see there that you know that this wound is not sealed. I call it as the trip and blue seals test and it's very effective for sealing and then you can just go and seal that wound as well on the side port. I make another small pocket on the side port and inject BSS and uh, there you know then you can check to see whether it's sealed and I'll be over now in two seconds but I think you go back and try this it works really well and with that I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much Dr. Gaurav and thank you very much all the speakers and the audience and Shashi Kapoor is here to take over the next session. Thank you.